know, Ben, it's hard to go back to that's a long time. <laughs> that you're here. I really am thankful that you've come to be part of our church. It, it, it really is a blessing to be able to, to gather in the presence of the Lord. And this morning we want to preach part two of the series Grounded. Grounded part number two. Now this sermon is a very familiar scene that I preach in this church. This specific sermon may have a different title but a very similar structure. It's However, the importance of the context of today's message um, cannot be ignored, nor should it be silenced due to its common appearance in my ministry, because it is this message this morning that is the essence of remaining grounding. Today, I want to preach being grounded in the basics, grounded in the basics, the basics of the word, the basics of prayer, and the basics of forgiveness. If you have your Bibles today, turn to the book of Psalms 119. I'm going to read what I you would probably consider a lengthy passage of Scripture. I'm going to read 16 verses out of this psalm. Psalms 119, verse 1 through 16. It says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep His testimonies and that seek after Him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity, but they walk in His ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respected to all thy commands. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when, shall, when I shall have learned the righteous judgments. Verse 8 says, I will keep thy statutes and forsake me not utterly. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart I've sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all the riches. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to preach. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to come get a word from heaven. I pray, God, for the anointing that will stir us, convict us, ground us, break our bondage, I pray. I ask you, Father, now to help me to, to speak over the next... 20 some odd minutes with an anointing that will keep the attention of this congregation and plant seeds of deliverance in their lives. <laughs> Truly, God, let us become grounded in the basics. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. <laughs> it's very hard to read 16 verses, only 16 verses of this chapter, because this chapter is the longest chapter in the entire Bible. This psalm expresses a deep and intense love for God's written word. It is it deals with and it refers to the word as a promise, as a command, as a guide, as a testimony, as teaching, as wisdom, as truth, or righteous, as correction and rebuke. The word is also presented as the psalmist's comfort. The word is considered its protection, treasure, the rule for life. It's to delight in his heart, in his soul, and it's the resource of all of his needs. The psalmist expresses a deep love for God by reading the word, by meditating on the word, and by praying as he ponders the word of God. The psalmist in Psalms 119 throughout all of his many verses teaches that we'll only grow in grace and righteousness. Now grace is God's undeserved favor. 
Righteousness is God's enabling, enabling us to live in a right relationship with God. To help us to live right. That only comes through God. So in order to grow in grace and to grow in righteousness, it only happens as we grow in God's Word. In other words, as God's Word increases in my life, then the God's grace will increase in my life. As the Word of God increases in my life, then God's righteousness will increase in my life. When will we as a church... Develop such a love for God's Word. When will we realize that it is His Word that will sustain us? It's His Word that will comfort us. It's His Word that will order our steps. It's His Word that will correct us. It's His Word that will rebuke us. It's His Word that gives us answers. It's His Word that gives us strength. In His words, there's knowledge and wisdom. In His words, there's revelation and power. In His Word is righteousness and holiness. We must become grounded in God's Word. Let Amen. us read it and ponder it. Let us meditate on it. Let us research it. Let us study it. And let us know it. His word is a mighty weapon of defense. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces coming and it pierces going. His word divides the sunders. We need his word. Can I encourage you? Let it be more than an occasional casual read. Let it become the essence of our being. Let it become the heartbeat of our spiritual lives. Let us use the word of God to destroy the works of the enemy. Let us use the word of God to pull down strongholds. Let us use his word to ignite our praise and to lift our heaviness. Let us use the word of God as a voice and as a prayer. Let us use the word of God to become grounded in the holiness and the precepts of God. I encourage you as members of the Rising Fawn Church of God, let us become grounded and not some theology of today's society and not the theology of, of political correctness, but let us find that it is God's holy, unadulterated word that will keep us in peace and keep us in favor. It is his word that will keep us on the right track. It is his word that will lead us and guide us. Let us become grounded in the word. Amen. Amen. You cannot use it as an every now and then. It cannot just be an occasional, occasional novel that you like to dip into. This must become the breath of your life, the beat of your heart. It must become your passion. It must become the thing that draws you in the morning and in the middle of your midnight trial. It is the word of God that when you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and your room is filled with the darkness of hell, it is that word that will penetrate and pull out darkness and bring in light. Yes, My amen. Lord, let us not just turn yeah. the word of God in times of trouble, but let us on the mountaintop realize that God is God amen. and he's going to be there when we fall off the mountain back into the valley. Let us have a favor of God's word when we're in the valley or in the mountain. It is God's word that sustains us. Get in his word. As you become grounded in the word, you'll also become grounded in prayer. Prayer is, prayer is not some mysterious practice reserved only for the pastor. Oh, I want my pastor to be a prayer warrior. It is not some secret thing that is reserved only for the religiously devout. It's not just the little old gray-headed grandmothers of yesterday that should be prayer warriors. Right. Because prayer is simply communicating with God. It is a time of talking to Him, but it's also a time of listening to Him. Amen. Believers can pray from the heart. We can pray freely. We can pray spontaneously. We can pray in our own words. We don't even have to use these and thou's. We can pray on the assembly line. We can pray driving down the road. We can pray by cutting the grass and washing right. the dishes. Amen. We can pray by our bed or by our couch. Yes. We can pray in the living room or the garage. We just need to realize God needs His people to communicate to Him. We've got to pray. We've got to realize that if I don't pray, I don't breathe. I've got to become to realize if I choke off my relationship through prayer, I will choke off my being in Christ because I cannot survive. Listen, I can come to church, I can sing, I can clap, I can even give in the offering. But however, if you're not praying, you're only another warm body in a hot church and you're not doing anything for the kingdom of God. But when you get suited up in power and you get suited up in prayer, all of a sudden you will be a threat to the devil. He'll see you coming here running high because he knows there's power inside of you. We've got too many Christians
Christians nowadays that'll come to church and pray on Wednesday night and if we're well if we're lucky on Wednesday. But we'll come to church Sunday mornings and we pray and we'll say a prayer on Sunday night and then on Thursday we're trying to fight some devil. And I ain't prayed Monday and I hadn't prayed Tuesday. I didn't pray Wednesday and I hadn't yet prayed Thursday. And I find myself beat up by the devil, black and blue, discouraged, not knowing why life has treated me so bad. It's because you are too weak spiritually to stand the fight of a very strong enemy. But don't listen. But when I begin to get in prayer and I got a foundation called God's Word to stand on, all of a sudden I stand flat-footed, tall, my shoulders squared, because I realize He that is in me is greater than the devil fighting against me. And I'm not afraid. I'm not intimidated. I am standing in prayer. Brother Chris, you just don't understand how I get so afraid of people and I get so afraid of the attack and I get so afraid. Listen, that's because you need to get to another level of prayer. Amen. Yes. Because I'm gonna tell you, I really I, let me just act, let, let's act like uh, somebody, uh, Mom Bell. That's my grandmother's name. That way I don't use anybody in here. Let, let's say Mom Bell is a prayer warrior. I ain't never seen no gray-headed saint afraid of any old devil. Right. They'll pray in the middle of the midnight hour. They'll walk the floors with a hibble and a hobble because they realize it is prayer that will yes. heal them. You yes. said one time, yes. great granny had to depend on not a doctor but on a God to see them through. Right. And now we've got right. the convenience of a modern society. Society. And I'm not against doctors and I'm not against the modern societies. Thank God for the microwave so it warms my meals and it cooks my pot pies. But when I come to God, I'm not going to get a pot pie God that's heated for five minutes in the microwave. Amen. i got to spend some time in a closet Amen. all along with Him Amen. so that I can come out and do with His power and do with His authority. You have to understand that when you become grounded in prayer. All of a sudden, you're not just filled with power. You walk out of that thing going, hey boy, devil, yes, demons, right. imps, you better watch out because right. I am somebody. Amen. I don't come in my own words. I don't come in my own authority, Amen. but I come in the name of the Lord oh. Jesus Christ. Amen. Somebody grounded in prayer realizes that whatever I bind on earth shall right, be bound right, in heaven. Right, yeah. And whatever I loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Let us become people that are grounded in God's word and grounded in prayer. So when the devil tries to fight this church, right, we don't have to. Well, I'm about to get into some amazing right. gossip body stuff right here. So go ahead and, and lift up your toes and go ahead and, 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 and get your iPhones out and record what I'm about to say so that I can, uh, uh, you can talk about me. But here's the tip. <laughs> tell you is, when the church becomes prayerless, and they become weak in prayer, you know what'll happen? There'll be people in the community talk about how all I ever do is preach about money, Amen. and you don't have the strength to stand up and defend Amen. your church or your pastor, because Amen. you let them run me over like I'm some dirty dog oh. in the street. If I was you, I'd say, boy, you better watch out. Don't talk about my preacher, and don't you talk about my church. I'm not afraid We Christians of the modern day have become so weak and timid and coward yes. that we are afraid to stand for holiness and righteousness. Right. But Amen. God's raising up a remnant. This is not Amen. the first time I've said it. He's trying to find a church somewhere that's going to get grounded in the holy precepts of God's word and grounded in the power of prayer. Yes. And he's going to raise up a group of people that in the last days will shake the gates of hell. And we won't be afraid of the devils that will fight against us. We won't be afraid of the attack because we realize it is not in my strength but in the strength of a God that I pray to. Amen. I got to remember I got Methodist over here. Lord, help me. Let me. Let me get back to my notes. I was raised Methodist, you rumblings. Don't you get scared. Now listen. Let me quickly do this. So how do we pray? What's the correct posture of prayer? Brother Chris, tell me how I need to pray. You can pray kneeling. You can pray bowing. You can pray on your face. You can pray standing. All of those are 
examples we see in the Bible. You can pray with your eyes open or you can pray with your eyes closed. You can pray quietly. You can pray loudly. If you ever walk in on my prayer time, you probably don't even have to walk in because you're going to hear me outside before you enter the door. Because I'm going to lift up my voice and I'm going to pray and I will sometimes pray until my throat becomes dry. That's just how I feel comfortable praying. I like to be able to pray out loud. You don't have to pray out loud. You can pray silently. You don't have to use any kind of fancy language, but if you want to use all the fancy language you want to. You can up the Bible, open up the Bible and pray the scriptures and put your name in the place right. of those people. However you feel comfortable, you just pray. Yeah. You just pray. Your prayers don't need to be wordy or impressive. You know what I've discovered? Is that people are praying for people's pleasure, not to God. Amen. Because people are standing, lead a prayer in the congregation, and somebody's going, Oh, that is such a pretty prayer. Oh, he just prays so pretty. Right. I love it when Brother Sam prays. It's just it's so wonderful. And so we ain't praying to you. Amen. I'm not trying to impress you. Right. I'm trying to ring the prayer bells of heaven and hold on to the altar, Amen. the horns of the altar, until I get a prayer through. And let me tell you, sometimes prayer ain't pretty. And sometimes it's not eloquent. Sometimes it is just nasty, raw, yeah. and, and, and beggarly. When right. you grab hold, begging God, if you don't show up today, I'm going to die. Right. God, I've got to have your help right now. Sometimes Amen. all you can do is go, oh, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. When you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered only by repeating their words again and again. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. Now why should I pray? Why should I pray? Because prayer develops relationship yes, with God. Amen. If I never speak to Sister Amy again, now someday she would be very happy. But if I never spoke to Sister Amy again, our relationship would soon be over. We could live in the same house and sleep in the same bed, but we would not have relationship. So I've got to be able to communicate. Prayer is nothing more right. than communication. Amen. It's you talking to a God you cannot see. But let me give you a promise right now. We don't walk by feelings, but by faith. Amen. But when you pray enough, you'll begin to feel God show That's up right. wherever you are at. I know that there are times I pray and I feel like I'm banging my head against the floor or against the wall. But every now and then, it's that time when the presence of the Lord enters my private time that makes me go through all the dry seasons of prayer because I know if I'll endure to the end, I'm going to be saved. And it's through the dry times of prayer right. that God is filling up the bucket to pour out my God, to pour out His blessing. What you got to realize, you get that little image that just came to my mind, is that I'm going through a tired, dry time, but I'm still praying. I'm still interceding. I'm holding on to the horns of the altar. And the whole time God's going, hey, Gabriel, fill up this bucket, bucket full of blessings. And as soon as it gets to the time that's about to dump out on that man right there, he's in a dry time and he's praying like is still rich. He's like David dancing even though he don't hear no music or feel no feelings. He's worshiping me even though he is dragging the bottom. And then all of a sudden you walk in prayer and you raise your hands and you go hello Jesus and the power of heaven falls down on you because you've been blessed. But you've got to communicate. It is the intimacy of prayer that offsprings are sprung. In other words, without an intimate relationship with God through prayer, we will not have spiritual babies. A church that does not pr pray is a church that does not grow because it is only through my intimate relationship with God and my talking with Him and my communicating with Him that I'm drawn into His presence. And when I get into the presence, here comes another baby about to be born because the seed has been planted deep into my spirit because I got intimate with God. Zechariah chapter 13 verse 9. I will bring the group through the fire. I will make them pure just as gold and silver are refined and purified by fire. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say these are my people and they will say the Lord is our God. Listen, why do I want to pray? Because when I pray, he answers. Amen. Anybody ever bought your cell phone a wife and then you ask this question? Why do you have a cell phone? 
and they don't ever answer it. Or has any of you wives ever called your husband and asked, why do you have a cell phone when you never answer? Or do you anybody have a son named Madison? No, no. Anybody ever have a teenager <laughs> that will answer text throughout the midnight hour yes. mm -hmm. and text about 3,000 times a month until I text him? Yeah. And all of a sudden his phone must be dead or left in the car or I didn't hear it go off. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It's only when I'm trying to get in touch with him. But I've got a God that never has a dead battery or is ignoring my call. I've got a God that his ears are open and he doesn't have to worry about putting somebody else on hold because he's there with you as he is with me. Thank God I've got a God that when I call, he always answers. And you ought to go, amen. John chapter 15 verse 7 says, But if you stay joined to me and my words remain in you, there we go grounded in the word, right? Mm -hmm. If you stay joined to me and my words remain in you, you shall ask any request you right. like. Right. Ooh, that's a mouthful right there. Yeah. I got on the professor's vest today. I look more like a, a, a college nerd than I do a, a pastor this morning. <laughs> But can I just allow this scripture to become deep into your spirit? If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you're grounded in the word. Yes. It's not an occasional, occasional, casual read. It is the essence of your being. When the word, when you can speak the word of God as easy as you can, your words. Yes, amen. Ooh, y'all are real quiet about right that. <laughs> when the word of God flows out in problems instead of complaints. Yes. Listen. Y'all the quietest church of God called. The Rumleys just thought they were back in the Methodist church. Thank y'all. Y'all just made that feel so good just then. Oh, that was wonderful. I'm talking about when circumstances knock you down. Instead of whining and complaining, the word of God begins to bubble out of you. That's what it means So your words, you're remained and you're grounded in the word. When the word is deep inside of you, grounded and planted and growing, producing roots, all of a sudden, you ask anything you want. Yeah. And it will be granted. Now listen, here's what a lot of preachers preach. If you ask anything you want, it will be granted. And we got people asking for everything they want. And it's not being granted. And they're wondering, why in the world are my prayers not being answered? It's because you're not in the Word. Amen. And you're not grounded in Him. Because when you get grounded in the Word, you'll find yourself praying for the Word to come to pass instead of your lust to come to pass. Amen. Amen. Victory, victory, victory. I've had it in my soul since Jesus made me whole. Victory, victory, victory. Y'all can look at me mean and ugly if you want to. But victory today is mine. We've got some charismatic Pentecostal junk going on because we think we can name it, claim it, grab it, and blab it. But the problem is you've got to be grounded in the Word for God to show up. We're trying to abuse the Scripture and use all of it. I got to move on. We got a wedding to do. Listen. The Lord instructs us to pray. Why am I going to pray? Because we've got instruction. Yes. Matthew chapter 26 verse 41 says, Keep alert and pray, Jesus says. Listen to what He says. Keep alert and pray. Otherwise, temptations will overpower you. Yeah. For though your spirit is willing, the body is weak. Yes. So how do I overcome temptation? By remaining in the Word and remaining in prayer. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Jesus told His disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and never give up. Amen. Ephesians 6, 18. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer requests. With this mind, be alert and always keep on praying with all the saints. Listen, a church that does not pray is a church that will not remain. Amen. You must be a church that will pray. Amen. Let this church and these individuals... Fall in love with prayer and get grounded. Will our children learn to handle difficult situations in life by seeing you pray? Will our children learn to call on God when everything falls apart because they see you calling on God when everything falls apart? Will they continue to hang on to God and pray to Him no matter what happens? You see, our example of prayer teaches our children how to pray. Yes. Now listen to this. However, prayer is only effective if you forgive. Prayer is only effective if you say forgive. Everybody say forgive. forgive. Yeah. We've got to become grounded in forgiveness. 
Because all forgiveness hangs the balance of my prayer and the effectiveness of God's word. Matthew chapter 6 verse 14 says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But now listen to this. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither with your will your Father forgive you your trespasses. So all of us want forgiveness. Lord, all of us have knelt in the altar and gone, Oh God, please forgive me. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my wrongdoing, God. Forgive me for my mess ups. But God's forgiveness hinges on your forgiveness. Yes, it is. Mark 11, 24 says, Therefore I say to you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you shall receive them and you shall have them. Oh, that's taken all the time. And we love that scripture. Pentecostals can quote it. They dance to it. But then it says in verse 25, And when you stand praying, forgive. Amen. I mean, I can ask and receive, but only if I forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Verse 26 is repeated. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Amen. I'm about to ask you a very serious question. Very thought-provoking questions. How many people in this church will go to hell because you cannot forgive an ex-husband that abused you? You cannot forgive the father that sexually took advantage of you. You cannot forgive the father that abandoned your mother and left you all alone. How many of you will go to hell because you're not willing to forgive the friend that used you and manipulated you? How many of you will go to hell because you will not forgive the boss that fired you or the person that turned against you and turned you in? How many of the people in this church are living lives poisoned by unforgiveness? Think about that. It seems you can never go forward in life or in your walk with Christ because every time you take it a few steps forward, bitterness and resentfulness and hatred knocks you backwards because you've not forgiven. Amen. Brother Chris, but you don't know how bad it is. You don't know how bad I've been hurt. I can't let it go. I can't forgive. I can't get over it. Listen, it's simple. A person who's not grounded in forgiveness is not grounded at all. And Jesus cannot forgive you when you cannot forgive others. I know this is rough, but you better take it up with Jesus. He's the one that said it. So let me close today with this. How do I forgive? This is from an article Joyce Meyer written from a series she taught called Do Yourself a Favor, Forgive. In that article, she says this. If you're going to forgive, you've got to decide to forgive. You'll for never forgive if you wait until you feel like it. I'm going to forgive that man who abused me when I get over my hurt. You'll never get over it. I'm going to forgive that woman that cheated on me. As soon as I can forget it, you'll never forget it. But you've got to make a decision to obey God and to forgive. And you've got to make a quality decision to forgive. And God will heal the wounds of your emotion. When you forgive, then God brings that healing in your life. Secondly, you've got to depend upon God and depend upon the Word. You cannot forgive without the power of the Holy Spirit. It is too hard to forgive in your own. I cannot forgive somebody that did me bad, hurt me emotionally, spiritually, or physically, or financially without the power of God in my life. God will enable you, but you've got to humble yourself and you've got to cry out to Him. <clears throat> Book of John, chapter 20, verse 22, Jesus breathed on His disciples, disciples and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Then His next instructions linked to that had to talk about forgiveness. Yeah. It is through the power of God's Spirit that you will be able to forgive. Yeah. So don't depend upon yourself to forgive. Depend upon the power of God. And then third, you've got to obey the Word tells us, Madison, the Word tells us several things we're to do concerning forgiving our enemies. I've got to obey the Scripture. Here's what the Word says. I've got to pray for the happiness and the welfare of those who abuse me. You ever been in prayer? Somebody's <clears throat> hurt your feelings and you call out their name going, God killed that old Satan looking like Jezebel. <laughs> Lulu, killer God. Take Lulu. We've all done that. I've been guilty, right? 
But you know what you're supposed to do? God literally bothered me, hurt me, broke my heart. I pray your blessings upon her. Amen. I pray your blessings upon her family. I pray, God, you allow her to see her faults and get saved, that she can go to heaven. I just pray. That's the word. It also says you've got to pray for their happiness, pray for their welfare. You've got to bless and not curse. As you pray, God can give you revelation. Yes. As you pray for somebody, they might not even be aware that they hurt you, and God can allow them to realize that. But forgiveness is not about how it affects others, it's how it affects you. And I've got to bless. In the Greek, the word bless means to speak well of. To curse means to speak evil of. You cannot walk in forgiveness and continue to gossip about the person that hurt you. You cannot come to the altar and say, God, I forgive Lulu for all of her hurts. And then over lunch, talk about how much Lulu hurts you. You've got to bless and not curse. You've got to quit repeating the offenses of what somebody's done for you. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 9 says, He who covers an offense seeks love. You begin to seek the love. You begin to cover them with love. Bless them. It's hard to do, but God's called us to live a life of opposites. And you got to forgive quickly. You cannot hold on to a grudge. You cannot hold on to an old past hurt. Thinking, well, I'm going to let go of it as soon as I get even. No. The Bible says, vengeance is mine the Lord. So you let God take care of the person that's hurt you. And you lay them in the altar and you forgive them quickly. And then you forgive freely. Don't try to forgive expecting to collect later. I'm going to forgive Lulu of how she hurt me. But I'm going to expect Lulu to come and make amends. Lulu ain't or never. Very seldom will she walk up to your door and say I'm sorry. So you just give freely. The Bible says freely you've been forgiven, so you can forgive freely. God has given you the ability to forgive. Jesus, even while dying on the cross, did not hold it against those who cursed him or those that were about to stick a spirit aside. Even in his dying breath, Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Freely. How many of you are being held back in your walk with Christ because you've not forgiven freely? And you've not forgiven quickly? Let us become a church grounded. Grounded in the basics of the word. Grounded in the basics of prayer. And grounded in forgiveness. It's a hard lesson to learn. The Lord began to teach me early in life, in ministry. I was 21 years old when the first knife I felt went through my spirit. And it was right before church and I had to walk back and see that lady that just speared me in the back. The last thing I wanted to do was walk into the church doors and see her singing on the praise team. Because I knew how she had spoke to me just a few minutes before. I knew how she had ridiculed me. I knew how she had basically cursed me. So to watch her on the praise team didn't cause me to want to praise, but want to curse her. But the Lord, through that experience, taught me how to forgive. And listen, I have to be honest. I forgave her with lots of prayer. I didn't have an instant relief of, oh, I love sister, whatever her name was. But I knew that I was getting over it when I no longer thought about her hurt anymore. And then, as a matter of fact, one day, I saw her years later. I ran up and hugged her and forgot that she had even hurt me. You've got to learn how to forgive. Well, it's, I don't want to forgive. I want to be mad and angry and resentful. I, I want to get even. I want to be... I want to be there. No, you don't. You want to go to heaven. As a church... <laughs> 
that has the potential to be a last day remnant will not achieve the fullness of God's greatness until we are grounded in the word and prayer and forgiveness. Get grounded in Jesus' name. Stand with me.